Some of the boatmen would not for all the world pass a night at Netley Abbey. There were ghosts there. There were ghosts there to be sure, yet there was dancing. The people of Southampton and the neighborhood often met at the Abbey and held a kind of festival. The Cistercian monks would not have approved of 18th and 19th century attitudes to their house of prayer. They came to Netley with proper devotion when they left Bewley Abbey and crossed Southampton Water in the year 1239. The discipline and craftsmanship of medieval architecture reflected the Cistercian state of mind. Sixteenth-century additions might be strange, but not a sacrilege. Later generations committed this. People came along and removed what took their fancy. The abbey's stones went in cartloads for building elsewhere. Visitors were thrilled by the solemn stillness of the ruins in the shadow of the woods. Under every tree, a goblin. From every stone, a ghost. Today, the ghosts are only shadows, but the stones can still remind us of those who first came across the water in the wake of prayer. is the Welsh border in the 13th century. Llewellyn, Prince of Wales, threatens to overrun Glamorgan. Earl Gilbert de Clare is building Caerphilly Castle against such an attack. Thick walls were once thought impregnable. Now defence in depth is needed against the tactics of 13th century warfare. New ideas have been brought home from the east by the Crusaders. It is planned to have inner and outer wards on concentric design. Arrow slits will cover every entrance. Wide water will surround the whole fortress. Caerphilly would be a formidable place to conquer in this type of warfare. king seeks peace and places the castle in neutral hands. But when the king's man departs, Earl Gilbert forcibly regains his possession. The castle is besieged again and again. Later, King Edward I leads an army into Wales and finally conquers the country. Later again, the castle comes under siege, but gunpowder delivers the mortal wound. In the Civil War, the towers are demolished, the lakes are drained. Caerphilly is no longer a fortress. But no one can damage the magic Caerphilly stands for. And if we have a mind to, all of us can share in those stirring adventures of long ago.
This abbey at Furness in Lancashire was founded in the 12th century under the patronage of the last of the Norman kings, Stephen. Almost 400 years later, the brethren surrendered their great Cistercian house to the Tudor monarch, Henry VIII. In the centuries between is the history of a wealthy establishment. Forests to the north, iron in the hills, sheep in the valleys. These and other possessions paid for the fine buildings that grew apace. The splendor of the abbey attracted worldly attention, not always favorable. One of the monks was a naughty fellow. He became a pirate and plundered his own house. More serious were raids by the Scots. In medieval days, the border was much further south, and Robert Bruce came from the Lake District to ravage Furness. The abbot had to pay ransom for the whole population. The later history of Furness was more peaceful, and the abbey enjoyed the almost total independence of great wealth. The brethren's generosity to their tenants became the talk of the countryside. Each week, tenants carried away barrels of beer and loaves of bread. And the field laborers would go to the kitchen for their meat and drink. The Cistercians are renowned for their personal austerity, but the shades of their past generosity linger among the ruins, and visitors today can still feel like welcome guests. You are in the world, but not of it. Your food is brought to your cell through a hatch, angled so that you may not see the face of the server. You may not speak your thoughts. Even in church you will recite only part of the divine office. May God be with you. The Carthusians in medieval times were more hermits than monks. But life was tolerably comfortable in Mount Grace Priory. The monastery was larger than most. Surrounding the greater and lesser cloisters were separate gardens for each cell. The cells were in effect small houses, each having two stories and four rooms. There was space enough for submissive or rebellious meditation. So must have thought King Henry IV. The royal will was opposed by Archbishop Scrope. Henry cut off his head. The king also deprived the priory's founder of his dukedom. And when the duke rose in rebellion, the king had more serious thoughts. He lopped off his head. The founder's downfall led to disputes over the priory's endowment. Later, some monks were imprisoned. They refused to accept Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries. They were sustained by the work of an earlier prior named Nicholas Love. He's remembered for his translation into English of St. Bonaventure's mirror of the life of Christ. It seems as if the prayers of the brothers were answered. For when they submitted to the king in 1539, he granted pensions to them all. At least they had their daily bread. Welsh princes in the north are defeated. 
the castles of Edward I of England rule in the year of grace 1283. No fortress is more formidable than Conway. The battlements give the archers alternating fields of fire. Gateway and forecourt can be raked from every angle. On Good Friday in the year 1401, a carpenter is admitted. Most of the garrison is at church in the town. He raises the portcullis. The followers of the rebel prince, Owen Glendower, rush in. Conway is taken by trickery. The rebels are ready when Henry Hotspur, Chief Justice of North Wales, attacks. Hotspur finds that pardons alone bring peace. Peace restores the castle as a residence. The Great Hall is once more a place to dine in and take one's ease. Persons of quality again enjoy the privilege of sleeping in the King's Tower. The castle keeps the King's peace. Gunpowder breaks it. In 1646, Conway falls to the Parliament forces. The city walls and the castle set within hold to this day rich memories of many centuries. Here is the stuff of history that we ourselves can see and touch and conjure up again. This is Fountains Abbey, founded in the 12th century by 13 Benedictine monks. They spent the first winter sheltering under an elm tree in land described as thick set with thorns, fit rather to be the lair of wild beasts than the home of human beings. The abbey was to be austere and simple, to symbolize the rule of poverty. When the priests were joined by lay brothers who were scientific farmers, the rule of poverty seems inappropriate. The abbey became one of the wealthiest in England. The setting seems idyllic. One can hardly imagine a wilderness in this view across the original bridge that has remained unchanged for centuries. Revo Abbey was founded a year before Fountains, and the lie of the land caused the church to be built nearly south-north instead of the customary east-west. In the 13th century, parts of the abbey were enlarged, but the cost was crippling. Slowly, the additions were removed, until the suppression of the monasteries in 1538 completed Revo's decline. The preserved shell is still an impressive monument to the work of the monks and to the magnificence of their architecture. Thank you.
In days gone by, the River Ore ran full and wide to Framlingham. Stone came by water to build a castle for the Earl of Norfolk in the reign of Henry I of England. Ditches were dug to surround the massive walls of the outer court. The second fortified enclosure, the lower court, was once protected by an artificial lake. Curtain walls defended the inner court. The earls and their countesses were powerful subjects. They sometimes threatened the safety of the throne. Henry II dismantled Framlingham's defences, but on his death, the second earl rebuilt them more strongly. In the year 1215, King John took the castle by force of arms. Later kings thought to ensure against rebellion. A new line of Norfolk's was created, but again the earls proved too powerful. Framlingham was forfeited to the crown. The Norfolk crest remained through many changes of rebellious ownership. The last threat to the throne was in 1553. At Framlingham, Mary Tudor was announced Queen of England. Her supporters encamped outside the walls. The castle was put under a governor, and safe at last from rebellion and vaulting ambition, became part of the book of history that we in the present day can see for ourselves. Yeah.